Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Kelsey. I am the Exhibitions and Programming Coordinator at Baton Rouge Gallery. I'm your host today for this episode of Artists in Residences. This is a twice a week check-in with artists of all kinds. Um, today, we're gonna be talking with two artist members of the Baton Rouge Gallery. Uh, we'll be talking about sculpture, ceramics, mixed media, work in clay, community, kind of everything. Um, so we'll be talking to David Scott Smith and Mike Lean Walsh. I will bring them on in just a minute. Um, first, I wanna say thank you to all of our um, members and donors. It is because of our community that we are able to bring you programming, even though we can't bring you into our physical space in City Park. Um, and speaking of City Park, I also wanna say thank you to Breck, who's been our partner for over 30 years and allows us to call City Park home. Uh, we hope to get back to our regular programming of first Wednesdays and Sundays at four and movies and music uh, as soon as it's safe to do so. Um, in the meantime, I want to talk very quickly about our Flat Curve Gallery. The Flat Curve Gallery is a space for artists of all ages, of all career ranges. Um, you can get to it by visiting our website. It'll be right there on the home screen. Our website is batonrougegallery.org. Um, all spelled out, batonrougegallery.org. You'll see a link to our Flat Curve Gallery. Um, there's description here on the program. There's also uh, a little form that you fill out down here at the bottom. Um, basically, just basic information. You can upload an image. You can tell us about it right here under the artist statement. Um, and we also have little prompts and suggestions on what you can do uh, if you're running out of ideas and you want to be a part of the community. So anyway, um, without further ado, I want to go ahead and bring on our guests. So let's all welcome David Scott Smith and Mikey Walsh. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Hi, David. Hi. How are you guys? Hi, guys. Um, so briefly, I wanted to bring you both on the, the stream today so we can do a deep dive into working in the round, working in 3D. Both of you work um, in ceramic and clay, is that right? I know you do some mixed media too, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So um, if it's okay with you guys, I would like to, nope, not that. Hold on one second. I wanted to show off some of your work. Um, before we get started, just for some context for everybody. Um, so let me see. So just going alphabetically, let's look at uh, a little bit of David's work first. Hang on here, let me pull it up. Of course, it's at the bottom of my available uh, things to share. <laughs> share that. Okay, so David, this is just on your website. Um, I left this main page up because I wanted to ask you a little bit about a couple of different things here. Um, your most recent exhibition at the Baton Rouge Gallery was titled Fear. Yes. And it featured works of mixed media, many that look a lot reminiscent of children's dolls and toys, um, elements of fiber, uh, taxidermy, <laughs> all kinds of things. Um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about this current body of work, as well as some of the previous work that you've done. And then, let's stop that for a second. I also wanted to show a little bit of um, Mikey Walsh's work. So let's pull that up. Um, Cause I wanted to actually point out some of the similarities in the content of recent work that you guys have made. Now, Obviously, you you make a lot of different different types of work, but recently I've noticed some similarities in what you make. So hold on, let me pull that up. <laughs> recently, I've been trying to rip off Mikey for twenty years. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's perfect. It's true. Okay, so Mikey, these are images from an installation at the um, Our Lady of the Lake Children's Hospital. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, my first. Big commission. Of course, it's taking a minute to scroll through images. Um, what I've noticed that's similar between these two works is the kind of nod back to childhood. 
Um, and some of the things that are sweet, some of the things that are a little scary, um, but it all kind of points back to like a youthful kind of playful uh, note in your studio work. Um, so my first question related to that is, um, I guess I'll start, I'll start with Mikey since we have her work up. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, why you made work, why you've made work kind of recently that's more geared in this way? Well, this recent um, installation at the Children's Hospital was made specifically with kids in mind. And my work is actually in the, the wing dedicated to, it's the, the St. Jude. Uh, the cancer wing. So all the work is kind of in that vicinity. And I wanted to work with the idea of um, something that would be dynamic enough. So the variations in the popsicles and the pencils and the different kinds of images um, varied enough that kids could pick like their favorite um, to grab their attention or to, to just have something to talk about that isn't being in the hospital. Um, mm -hmm. So that element of surprise. And I wanted it also to be joyful and colorful. And I think that is probably one of the stronger themes within this work is that nothing nothing could be scary. I wanted it all to be sort of comforting, joyful, something to capture their attention and something that would be, you know, just a distraction for families that are that are in the hospital. And because this was a commission, I also had to work for the first time with um, uh, the gallery owner, Ann Connolly who was the facilitator for this and the hospital itself. So she went between the hospital and myself. But with that said, I'll, I'll let David answer. Um, I'm curious because I have two children. He, he has two as well. Um, and I'm curious how he looks at um, these sort of return to childhood themes because I do think being a parent has, has impacted that as well. But go yeah. ahead. Well, I mean, I just wanted to, um, I don't know if it was accidental or not, but I was thrilled to be invited to do this today with Mikey because I'm not lying. She's been a huge influence. And uh, a lot of it is, you know, I was really a mold maker when I got to grad school and her work was pinched forms. And, and at first I really didn't like it at all. But as I've uh, progressed as an artist, I've, you know, I remember once, you know, you were showing us glazes and you were like, this glaze is so yummy. It just looks like I would want to lick it. And I've thought about that for years. Like, so I've, I've become more aware of uh, the uh, the more sensual aspects of clay instead of just trying to recreate something. And so back to the the, the dolls and whatnot, I, I, I love, it was years ago, you talked about having kids and how um, you didn't feel like making dark work as much anymore. And I've kind of gone the other way. I don't want to frighten my children, but I want to convey that I am terrified. <laughs> like I've never felt fear like I feel now. And I'm also realizing how superstitious I am. Uh, I shouldn't admit that, but I'm, you know, all those dolls that I made were made from, uh, I, I have a whole bunch of studio towels from a friend of mine who passed away. And so I've sewn a lot of those dolls out of his um, towels and uh, um, the, the hair is from, you know, like bear fur or there's actually hair from my, ch my children, both of them. In, in the dolls and, and things like that. So, but it wasn't, it's not meant for my children. If I was making something for my children, I wouldn't make these things. <laughs> um, they remind me of, of um, you know, voodoo dolls or, or yeah. puppets or, you know, stuffed toys. I mean, there's certainly a play on the whole history of those objects. Yeah. And, and I think that's something that you and I do share in common is that we were both drawn to figures. And in particular, yeah. I mean, I think dolls, Think about it like what are scary movies made, <laughs> made out of it they're they're horrific dolls. they're, well, they're things that uh, that we associate with childhood because i think they have a really strong like imaginative power they can go between mm -hmm. roles definitely and actually if you can leave it on this one like that those are uh uh the other thing that's interesting about toys are neglected toys mm -hmm. you know um i'm very 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 sentimental extremely yeah. so it, it disturbs me to go to the thrift store and see this giant bin of of stuffed animals for a quarter you know with suspicious stains and whatnot you know <laughs> um so i like using those yeah um but you know the other thing i was thinking of too and i think it relates to your work too is something as an artist if we were writers we wouldn't think twice about writing fiction 
but I think a lot of times people don't think about being fiction writers with with sculpture. And I've kind of embraced that I like writing horror or trying to, and I like humor, but I don't necessarily need it to be about me. I, I like the idea also of writing fictional or creating fictional things that might exist in other places that aren't necessarily directly about me. You know, that actually leads me into a question I wanted to ask both of you. Um, I see often in looking at uh, the overture of your work from both of you over the past couple of years, there's some sort of reoccurring themes and uh, almost reoccurring characters that happen. Uh, do you want to talk about that? Because it seems like when you're talking about narrative and talking about making a story or being interested in, in narrative and storytelling, um, do you guys think about that when you're making your work? Or do, do these reoccurring characters just happen without that much like behind the scenes thought? I'm waiting for Mikey. Oh boy, I was waiting for David. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I do think in general, I think every artist that I know has a certain um, set of ideas that they sort of walk around, talk around, think around, mm -hmm. and, and just, I think of it as a spiral, although I hate the image of a spiral. <laughs> um, yeah. That it's, that it's just something that you continue to work with. And with each pass, you sort of understand it a little bit tighter, a little bit deeper, a little bit further. So maybe an auger um, is a better image. So mm -hmm. you're sort of digging into that thing. And I don't know about you, David, but I, I think that, um, I mean, I certainly see threads in your work from 20 years ago, but I think it's, it's something that um, I don't really have a lot of control over mm -hmm. um, that I decide to make something maybe based on something I've read or seen or thought about. And it just, in some ways it develops on its own and it mm -hmm. tends to relate to thematically to something that I've done before, but I don't recognize that immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I, I would, I mean, I maybe shouldn't admit this, but I still think back to grad school, I was using a lot of imagery um, that I knew would get a lot of, uh, that, that viewers would really respond to, that they would really like. But I don't think that I was thinking about it in in a way that was much that, you know, I mean, maybe I was, but now I really try to, you know, if I make something, I think about it and I, I like things to flow intuitively, but then I also don't want to just sort of uh, engage in this activity that is um, just churning out the same old crap. Although I will say uh, uh, I really like making pots now, not mainly just because I love the activity. And I'm trying to make a good cup because I make a lot of really bad pots. My pots are just awful. But uh, I really like making cups and then selling them is really an enjoyable activity. And then it's sort of a warm up for for sculpture. What do you think? Yeah. And what do you think is different about pots than I mean, there's some obvious things, but. They're more difficult for me. I mean, a good cup is is really a, a nice piece of, uh, of art and. Uh, I like my cups. I'm really embarrassed. I didn't get Kelsey's email until we got here, but I would have brought one of your cups because I have a bunch of them. And I, you know, I have these objects. My my art collection is a cup collection and a pot collection. And I think that pots um, are really neat. They 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 serve the dual purpose of being these objects of great um, worth and value, but also something that I can use. You know, um, whereas a painting, yeah. I get kind of boring. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wanted Poke to talk about <laughs> I wanted to talk about the um, the functional side of each of your practice and how something like making a, a, a vessel like a you know something that someone's gonna hold in their hands they're gonna think of you inherently every time they use it um, there's a community aspect to that, which I think is echoed in the workshops of people who work with clay um, because of the need for shared equipment and uh, that shared space. There seems to be a vibe that's more community oriented among uh, sculptors and clay people who work with clay, ceramics, functional work. Um, do you guys have you noticed that in your practice or am I crazy? We're just nicer people. <laughs> You know, I've never met a uh, ceramic artist who wasn't just the most generous person with their time. 
Um, and I think that in my own practice in printmaking, there's a similar vibe there because a lot of us need this bigger equipment that is just impractical to have in the house. You know, you can be a painter and make work in your home and just kind of be a little hermit much easier than you can be a hermit as a ceramic artist. Um, and that seems to translate in a lot of the work. Yeah. Again, example by we're all using hand built yeah. ceramic cups to sip on our tea today. That's just a part of it. I, I, especially right now, you know, that is one thing that's really, um, you know, I keep finding myself back at the word tac tactility in that the students, like I have two classes and I go, David, you have classes too, but mm -hmm. it's near impossible to replicate, you know, with any mm -hmm. household materials, kind of the, what, what clay has or what clay does. And I think that, um, I know my students are really struggling with not being able to, to make things out of clay. So that's certainly there And the community thing. It's ironic because I talked to my students the first day of the semester and just said, the most important thing is that you just show up, just show <laughs> up with your materials. That's all you have to do because it's a community class. You have to participate and see what other people are doing and watch demos and, it's just so ironic about yeah. how static I was about the communal aspect and sharing. Mm -hmm. So and tell me, Mikey, you're still teaching, is that right? Yeah. David, are you teaching right now or are you doing the solo thing? Uh, yeah, let's use that term loosely, but yes, yes I am, yeah. Four <laughs> so <classes. laughs> how, how have things changed for you and how on earth can you teach these concepts via webcam? I mean, I know there's a certain, there's a ton of book knowledge that comes behind this. I mean, just the chemistry and the physics of it, absolutely. But what is the biggest difference that both of you are noticing in trying to do distance teaching? David? Well. One of the ironies, I'm lucky, the chair of my department let my advanced students take home pottery wheels. And our studio is so small that my pottery students here are actually making more pots at home than they are uh, than they were at school. We just don't have the space. So, and a lot of them are stuck in, in a house that maybe they had roommates before and now those roommates have left. So they're all alone and they're just churning out pots. And uh, I, I ordered clay from the, when it, when it first started, I ordered clay and delivered, you know, I order about 2000 pounds of clay. So uh, some of them have really taken off, but, but a lot of them just are unable to work with clay. So it's, it's just been a shit show. <laughs> um, I, I think it's been for me um, and David, I saw the pots on your, on your Facebook page. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, whole palette of pots. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think has been really great is I've gotten the students to really look at history, all the historical ceramics. I mean, the one of the one of the things I kind of geek out about is just, you know, neolithic pots, all the ways that people have worked in clay for thousands and thousands of years, you know, and and many of the objects that they've made, they're still around because they're ceramic and they're permanent. So going there's a great collection on L, on LSU's website called Art Store which is a, a you know a visual database and so all my classes they've all done history and research um, projects that are based on trying to find you know historical images and contemporary artists who are using those the same um, either visual uh, cues or forms or glazes or so I've kind of used it as an opportunity for them to kind of go deeper into history, which is always hard to do mm -hmm. in a class because they get so excited about what what they want to make, which is understandable. So tucking in the history and kind of giving them some context has been real important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would second that. I would say in class, it's really hard to get them to pay attention when you're giving presentations because they just want to work. Um, but especially uh, how sophisticated a lot of that work is. I love pre-Columbian art. I could look at it all day. And any of those pieces could be made with pinched forms, you know, at home. Um, that's yeah. kind of one thing that I've been thinking about, you know, preparing for next semester is, you know, I don't want to teach this online, but if, if we have to go online, um, you know, just being really clear in the syllabus that they need space at home to work and then document their work. Um, <laughs> Absolutely, David. Absolutely. And, and I think that, you know, that's another facet too, is like I've been looking at and kind of trying to see what other people are doing so yeah. that 
we go forward, you know, I'm, I don't need to reinvent the wheel. You know, mm. I, yeah. I want to learn from my peers, you know, what, what's working, you know, what, yeah. what can be done because there's so much we don't know. And right. I know everyone's really eager to get back in the studio, but it's not, it's not going to happen right now. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, something else too, that a lot of times, you know, uh, I'm not that old, but I was trying to do videos and trying to figure out how to do it. And my 10 year old had to show me how to edit the videos on my phone. You know, these students are very savvy when it comes to photographing and documenting uh, their work. So in a way there's an opportunity for them too. I mean, I, you know, I've heard colleagues say, oh, we can't teach it online. It's just impossible. But I kind of think it is like, well, it's not just one or two schools. It's the whole damn country. And if you're going to, oh, wow. yeah, if you have, if you have the choice of either not teaching it or teaching it, you find a way to teach it, you know? You're right. Yeah. 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 Um, that actually leads me to our next, my next question. Um, similar in, in the teaching aspect, but more personal. Uh, I know each of you has kids yourself. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I didn't get that wrong. Um, all right. So I wanted to know a couple of things. Uh, you're both having to juggle studio life, teaching, and helping your kids uh, figure out how to navigate distance learning. Um, so do you have any tips on finding that balance? <laughs> Does someone have tips for me? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mary Paula. <laughs> Paula. Oh, yeah. So Paula wrangles the children like she's home doing homework and she spends more time with the baby. I mean, the baby still needs her. He doesn't need me yet. Uh, so I, I could lie and say, I, you know, it affects me. I, I will say that that's one of the upsides of all this is I love being home with the kids more and uh, babies grow up so fast. Mine is just over a year old and every day it's just uh, something different. And we've read the same book like 500 times now. I didn't realize babies liked, the same book over and over and over again. But uh, I just love it. I love spending time with the baby. Yeah. Yeah, repetition, just like making pots. Yeah. yeah. Look over and over and over, pretty soon they'll be saying it back Moon. to Moon, yeah. <laughs> Tractor. <laughs> Moon. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, that's, that has been one of the more challenging things, um, in part because um, the kid, my two kids, you know, they're different ages. One has some special needs and it's been challenging to try to balance their two schedules. And they were actually at two different schools. Um, so fortunately, like David, I have a great husband, David, who is excellent with kind of keeping them on task and doesn't lose his um, patience, uh, which I've known been known to do. So we're, we're managing. <laughs> yeah, know, me too. <laughs> I think David, like David said, you know, I'm really just immensely grateful to have the time with them and the time to be together, just eat meals and do things yeah. like that. So it's, it's, um, it's a sad circumstance to have that, but I, yeah. I'm appreciating every moment of it. Yeah. Yeah. There's some definite upsides to this. I mean, I hate that people are dying and people don't have work and people are uh, scared. I've also, I'm really excited to see how people think about their communities and their friendships um, differently after this. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, so, so keeping in, in the theme of kids and uh, trying to block out the pandemic for a moment. Um, one of the last questions I wanted to ask you was how has your art practice changed since you had kids? Um, I'm assuming, of course, in this question that you've been making work since the day you were born, uh, which might not be the case, but uh, certainly that you probably have been making work since before the kiddos were around, probably. Um, so what what has their presence done for you personally as growing as an artist? David? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's such a big question. I yeah. think the 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 harder part it's like so i read this book it's called all joy and no fun it's about parenthood and i think that the, the part of having kids is like trying to manage everything um and so on a very selfish note which i know i am uh as an artist 
not enough time to do the things that I want to do. You know, I'll have a lot of ideas, but I just physically and physically don't have the time. So I'm actually in the process of moving to the house about a year ago and find his garage and get the electric upgrade and that will help a lot. But I think the biggest part has just been the amount of time that I can actually spend making it to this kid's but on the flip side, I feel like I have this amazing family and I wouldn't trade it for the world. So it's just trying to balance getting in the studio and producing like that body of work for the hospital. Mm-hmm. It took my whole summer at every burning the candle at every end to do that. Mm-hmm. So David, I'll hand it to you. No, I mean, I could have said the same thing. I would say that for me, uh, consideration has been a huge factor. Uh, and I know that it's still an issue sometimes, but I like to work. Uh, I'm kind of a manic you know, I like to get in the studio and not come out for three days. You can't do that when you have a family. You know, they they need that. They need you. And uh, um, I still like to work late at nights. But, you know, before I had a family, I'd work all night and then drink beer till noon and then fall asleep. And, you know, I mean, you can't – nobody wants to be around that guy. But I would say the same thing as Mikey is I I wouldn't trade my family for, for anything. I mean, in a way, I remember I was part of a show in Missoula, Montana with – all these great ceramic artists who were just freaking amazing. Uh, Richard Notkin, uh, uh, Julie Galloway, all these artists that I've looked at my entire life. Um, and at the after the reception, I went back to the hotel room and I was by myself. This was before I had a family. And I thought, wow, this is it. <laughs> you know, I've just been included in like, this is the best show of my life. And it didn't really impact me. Whereas, uh, you know, there's little things to celebrate every day when you have a family, and and so it's really rich. So it's it's not a trade-off. Um, I do wish I had more time, but at the same time, if I had more time, I don't know that I would want to spend it all in the studio either. I think maybe I'd want to go out and catch frogs or chase chickens or you know. So, I mean, right. yeah. <laughs> but I think yeah. it is it's sort of a note of caution in some ways to those of you who out who are out there who don't have children yet to really yeah. make the most of the time oh, yeah. that you have and, and to really get a good practice going because it is it is harder it's just a time-consuming process-oriented kind of medium and most artists struggle with I mean you could probably verbatim say the same thing for any any artist who has children or right, young yeah. children you know my kids yeah. are getting older and it's getting easier but I've heard that at some point they become good studio partners, but I don't know what, what at what point that, that they is like a thing. It. If they like it, my son has yeah. will have no interest whatsoever in yeah. helping him. If it doesn't, <laughs> he won't care. No, I think what Mikey's saying is important for people to realize. Your children don't have to like what you like. And that can be one of the biggest heartaches. But, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't like sports, but my kids might like sports. Yeah. So I'm gonna have to go to sporting events. I mean, that just sounds awful to me, but I'll do that, you know. Uh, and uh, I don't know that uh, even even talking about the community of the studio, I I kind of like to be in the studio when I'm really working by myself, you know. Uh, Paula and I even have to separate everything out, so she's over on one side, and oh, look at that little dog back there. <laughs> I'm glad it's not just me that has literally all of my pets in the room with me right now. Yeah, and yeah, I love I that. Want a tree yeah. So he wouldn't bark. And- <laughs> she's blind and so she's like knocking into the wall. She's so. <laughs> she's- yeah. We've got a we've got a sleeping cat on the press over here. I know. I love that. I yeah. I do love yeah. being in people's homes and seeing yeah. their, you know, seeing all their. Cats. Yeah. Well, I wish I, I like could have, wish I could have done this at my studio because we have chickens crowing constantly out right outside the uh, studio, but. <laughs> is terrible. Look at so that. So your next project is to go ahead and get a Wi-Fi extender out into your studio so we can hang out with the chickens next time. No. Yes. No. <laughs> Come on, man. Just do it. Just just do it. Now we have an audience question um, which I can help answer, but I wanted to go ahead and show it to everybody. Um, people want to know where can they find your work online? Well, first and foremost, you can always look on their artist pages at batonrougegallery.org to check out uh, recent work or make inquiries. But um, specifically for you two, I would like to ask you to let the audience in on where where they can find you online. David? Uh, I have I have a website. Uh, I also sell things on Etsy, David Smith Ceramics, but that's mostly just my 
functional stuff. And then um, uh, my wife and I have a business called Little Lane Pottery, which we have a Facebook page and we will eventually have something going on more. But honestly, we, we sell most of our work at Astig um, down at the, the uh, um, National Seashore. And, uh, um, and that's been a good enough venue that I really haven't uh, spread myself out, you know, any more than that. That reminds me, I should tell our audience, David is an artist member of the Baton Rouge Gallery, but has since moved out of Baton Rouge. So if you're hoping to catch him at a festival, you're going to have to travel quite a ways to find him. Are you in Maryland now or where are you? Yeah, I'm in Maryland. And, you yeah. know, I, I, I mean, it's a larger discussion, but I used to do festivals and things like that. And now I, I really kind of like running my own show. Um, we have a landowner. In fact, anybody watching that makes work, I would encourage you to find a good location and ask the landowner if you can set up and sell. We do fabulous. And we cut out, you know, the middle the middle person. And, and uh, we're really hoping that we can get back to that this summer, hopefully. But um, it's a great gig. The, the key word there, everybody, is to ask permission to set up on someone's plot of land. <laughs> <laughs> you can show up in a cow pasture with your wares and expect it to be okay, especially yeah. if you are in southern Louisiana. People are crazy out here. So mm -hmm. ask permission. Okay. Um, so, Mikey, where can people find your work? Obviously, uh, our website, clearly. I honestly, I mean, I have a website, but I don't typically sell through the website. Sometimes people contact me. Um, I feel like the best place, honestly, is either through the Baton Rouge Gallery or um, if I have a show somewhere and I post it, that sh that would be for sale there. I'm sending some work to the Signature Gallery in Atlanta mm -hmm. um, this upcoming week with uh, Karma Queeston. Um, so I'll have some cups there, but I would, I often try to go through Baton Rouge Gallery. Mm -hmm. I wanna support local and I live here and I do try. So well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> We're happy to host your work and help people get connected with all of our artist members, obviously. Um, well, before yeah. we wrap it up, is there anything that I forgot to touch on that you want to talk about? Well, can I add one thing too on that is, yeah, I sell functional stuff that we make, but all of my, uh, I mean, the other stuff uh, is, is only through the Baton Rouge Gallery. I don't sell anywhere else. That's the only gallery representation that I have. Well, then you're going to need to send me some pictures so we can update both your pages. Make sure that your inventory is current on our website. That, um, and back to the parenting question, right? Yeah. So I mean, is there ever really like a complete answer to the parenting question? I feel like it's always kind of a open-ended dot, 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 because there's always more to talk about. Always. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, I want to thank both of you for coming on today. Thank you for your time. I know you are mm -hmm. both very busy, um, but, you know, I think- Are we? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for including us, Kelsey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I like a lot. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Bye, Bye, Mikey. Bye, Kelsey. Bye, everybody. Bye. All right, everybody. Thanks again for tuning in. We really appreciate you. And I want to remind you that this is a twice a week check in with artists of all kinds. Um, Tuesdays, we meet with artist members and we have deep dive discussions. And on Fridays, we have uh, more of a variety show uh, on. That's my dog eating a carrot in the background. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and end this and we will see you again for artists and residences on Friday. Take care. Bye-bye.